Anyone who has been watching my channel for a long time will know that it's no secret that I'm not the biggest fan of the DC Cinematic Universe franchise of films. A couple of notable exceptions aside, I, like many others, just never really connected with the vast majority of the material. And I say that as one of its kinder critics, in that I committed what the internet would deem a cardinal sin and actually found things to like in the first Suicide Squad movie, which I think is probably the most maligned entry in this whole fictional franchise besides Whedon's cut of the Justice League. I'm aware that once again voicing such a thought out loud naturally makes me very uncool, but the way I saw it is that it was extremely flawed, sure, but it was at least entertaining in that it felt like a $175 million movie as filmed through the lens of a hyperactive child really excited to tell you the backstory of his action figures. There was a quality in it that I enjoyed almost in spite of itself. It was definitely style over substance, but as a fan of the kind of aesthetic of the excess you see in things like WrestleMania, its neon drizzled nonsense occasionally tickled my simple monkey brain in a way that made me go, Ooh, shiny. Plus it also gave us Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn for the first time, which, while still needing some refinement in that movie, has now proven to be THE casting of the DCU. For a lot of people, Margot Robbie is Harley Quinn, and while I'll personally always have a soft spot for the Queen's accent at just a sidekick of the original, it's hard to argue that Margot Robbie's portrayal of the character hasn't become iconic in its own right, not only dominating the pop culture sphere, but also arguably forever changing the narrative trajectory and appearance of her comic counterpart, who has now been revised into a popular lead and often in a heroic role, as well as making the character a straight up household name, and probably one of the most popular characters in comics. Perhaps even more popular than the Joker right now, which she was initially created just to be a goon for. So yeah, the first Suicide Squad got some things right. I'd go so far as to say that if it had actual proper character arcs, themes, ideas and plot to go along with all this excess of style, which is to say if it were a completely different movie, I'd have actually straight up loved it. Luckily for me, that film now exists in the form of James Gunn's The Suicide Squad that just hit cinemas. The new Suicide Squad is good. Not good for a DCU film, not good for a superhero movie in a world oversaturated with them, just good. No qualifiers on that statement necessary. Following the story of a gang of various criminals with exceptional abilities sent on a do or die mission on the promise that if they succeed in their efforts they'll have years removed from their prison sentences, only for them to find out that the mission is not exactly what it seemed, the Suicide Squad is a gory, goofy, groovy great time, carried by an excellent cast navigating a tight, well paced and at times genuinely hilarious script. It's the kind of film where the director's touch really bleeds through into the end material. There's a clear vision and style present throughout one that doesn't really care to make its world universally palatable in a way to fit in with the larger fictional universe its film takes place in. And that last point might sound like a criticism, suggesting it ignores the great aesthetics of its franchise, but it's not. Superhero films often have a habit of creating this uniform look, like they almost have their filmmakers stick to a basic style guide to please the higher execs who are always looking at the bigger picture profitability of a cinematic universe, as opposed to seeing value in the original stories and styles that could be depicted within that universe. It's a tactic to make it so that characters don't look out of place when entering the narrative of another big hero's franchise, but it often leaves the world looking colourless, samey, without soul. A shot that always articulates this point best for me would always be Civil War's airport fight. I mean, personally I just think this looks totally lifeless. James Gunn and his team clearly do not care for this, and it shows. The Suicide Squad does not look or even feel like a film that takes place in the same narrative world as Batman vs Superman, or even the original Suicide Squad, but it's all the better for it. It looks like a 70s war movie. It looks like pop art. It looks like a comic book. It looks like a James Gunn movie. Hell, it might be the James Gunniest of James Gunn's movies, as it almost feels like a full circle film for him, in that it combines all of the major identifiers fires of his work, from both major phases of his career. It has a touch of that gross out imagery and dark humour of his starting days as a screenwriter for Troma Entertainment as well as his first two directorial efforts of Sliver and Super, but it also has the ensemble character work and quippy but heartfelt and optimistic sensibilities of his later big studio efforts on the Guardians of the Galaxy movies. And it combines all of these to great effect, feeling somehow both like familiar territory for the director as well as something new for him. It's a movie that knows exactly what it is, avoiding a 
trap that a lot of the DCU films fall into in trying to make some kind of gritty, grounded take on these characters, and instead just embraces the absolute inherent silliness of it all, but never in a way that feels like it's embarrassed of or making fun of the characters and property it spawns from, like these films often do. If you don't know what I mean by this, then just look at Aquaman's casting. This is what Aquaman most famously looked like. And don't get me wrong, I've got nothing against Jason Momoa, dude's a fine actor and all that, but doesn't it feel like this casting choice is trying to remove itself from the potentially quote unquote embarrassing nature of the original character's most famous incarnation? And then you look at James Gunn's take on Polka Dot Man, and not only is he not rejigged to become some hunky pro wrestler type, but his inherent silliness is embraced, not just in costume and aesthetics, but also in character, in a way that seems to really approach him with a complete sense of earnesty. Yes, Polka Dot Man is really dumb. He shoots polka dots. He's got all the conceptual gravitas of a children's drawing. But there's never any attempt to kind of do that sort of cooler, slicker reinvention like they felt the need to do, for example, with Superman or Aquaman, or even, in perhaps their most terrible misfire of edgier rebranding, the Joker. Or even that time that they thought they make an already edgy Batman even edgier by making him murder and brand people and gave him guns. James Gunn didn't do anything like that here. In fact, if anything, he made the character more lame. At least the polka dot man of the comic could turn his dots into things. Gunn's character just has gross spots that he has to either shoot or vomit or he'll die. He has serious mommy issues. He's awkward and weird. And yet, by the time the film's wrapped, if you're anything like me, you fucking love this guy. And that's really what holds the film together more than anything. Yes, it's got a great sense of style with its flashy action sequences and its cool use of in-world objects to create expository titles. Yes, it's got all of the signature humor humour and quippiness and chaotic gore Gunn has made his career trademarks, but more so than anything, it's Gunn and his cast's approach to characters that really makes the film work. I mentioned before that James Gunn approached Polka Dot Man with a sense of earnesty. And I use that character specifically as an example because I felt like he best exemplified what I almost think might be Gunn's philosophy when it comes to character writing in this film, and perhaps even when it comes to approaching superhero movies in general. Gunn is a guy who gravitates towards sincerity. He seems to take a liking to the oddball characters who no one else otherwise really enjoys, who are on the sidelines, who people forget about, and without trying to repackage them in a way that makes them more palatable to action movie audiences, he picks them up, dusts them off, and proudly declares in his best Marge Simpson voice, I just think they're neat. We saw him do this with the Guardians of the Galaxy to such great effect that it's hard to remember a time when the likes of a talking smart-mouthed raccoon and his best friend an inarticulate tree were not household names. And now he's applied what seems to be the same philosophies when writing The Suicide Squad. I heard what I think was a really telling interview Gunn did with BBC Radio 1 where he mentioned why the character The Condiment King, a Batman villain with ketchup and mustard guns, didn't make the cut when he was deciding what obscure DC villains were going to make his squad. And he said, Now, nah, you know, here's the difference. Like, Polka Dot Man was a sincere character. Like, somebody was writing Polka Dot Man, and I wish I could remember the creator's name, and they're like, this is a new Batman villain that we're creating named Polka Dot Man. And he was sincerely created. Condiment King is a joke. Like, they created him <laughs> as a joke. And he was like, oh, here's a stupid character. Whereas I don't care about kind of making. I find it super interesting that it's the sincerity that Gunn gravitated towards. That there was this character that everybody laughed at and treated like a joke, but more specifically a joke that its creators weren't in on. And he looked at that character and kind of took the idea that no one takes this guy seriously and thought, you know what? There's something interesting in that. And he represents that character in all of the ways that once made him a laughable internet meme and asks you to empathise with that. And what's super interesting is it succeeds. Gunn's a champion of the outsider characters, the oddballs, the weirdos, the ones that don't quite fit the mould of cool leading men and women. And while yes, you could point out that the lead of this ensemble cast is Idris Elba's character Bloodsport, who is a absolutely played straight macho assassin man, something far far more in line with the cool action guy style frontman we expect from these kind of flicks, especially DCU's output, but it's telling that his arc with him being that kind of audience stand-in is looking at this crew and thinking, for fuck's sake, who are these losers? And then growing through time to see the humanity beyond their gimmick, developing great appreciation for them and becoming better himself for it. They're a bunch of lovable losers, fully rounded people with interesting arcs and developments throughout the film's narrative. I love John Cena's brilliant portrayal of Peacemaker, starting out as an overly competitive complete dog with no sense of self-awareness, to slowly betraying this more menacing side bubbling below the surface.
surface as the film goes on. I love Daniel Melchior's charming approach to Ratcatcher, a seemingly lazy do-nothing layabout with an arguably overly optimistic view of the world, but whose strength and kindness acts as a positive chain that links all of the squad. I already loved Margot Robbie's take on Harley from her stint in her previous two movies, especially her portrayal in Birds of Prey, but here she gets this really quite incredible and unexpected moment of, I want to say growth, but it's actually not really growth because it's kind of just expanding on ideas and themes already explored with her character and Birds of Prey. So it's more like a solid statement of intent of who she is and what she represents right now. I don't want to spoil the context, but she gives this monologue about red flags and relationships and it's like, ooh, it's uh, it's fucking good, like, it just really cements this reinvention of Harley that's developed over the past decade or so in all of her stories. The only person I actually don't really like, and I feel like I might get a lot of flack for this because I very much expect him to become a fan favourite, is King Shark. He brings out a couple good laughs here and there, but he's kind of a nothing character. I mean, he's basically the Groot stand-in of this movie if we're all being honest, but he's just not particularly interesting. His only defining feature is is that he's kind of dumb, and he really doesn't bring much else to the table. He's the only thing that isn't really paid off as well, which I thought was odd. The whole plot is this constant barrage of like, set up, pay off, set up, pay off, often in really overt ways with clearly important plot elements being emphasised as if to say, yo, this'll be important later, and sometimes in more subtle ways with what you think is throwaway dialogue coming back to play a part, but always in a way that feels earned and plays out interestingly. King Shark, however, like three times, maybe more, do they mention how important he is going to be to get into this building that's their mission target? The woman who sets up the squad explains that's why he's there, she reiterates the need for his presence over comms after the crew get in a bit of a disagreement with him, and then Bloodsport states to a villain who tells them it's not easy to get into the building even with his access, well, we've got a fucking shark in that, so there, we'll get in, that's not exactly what he says, uh, I may have forgot the actual quote, but that was the gist, you get what I mean? So as an audience member, I'm like, they've super played up how important King Shark is going to be for this mission. I'm really excited to see what they do with that. No doubt he's going to get some big, crazy sequence just focused entirely on him, and it's going to be super fun and over the top and very specific to his unique strengths and abilities. You know, I'm thinking something akin to what Quicksilver gets in like X-Men First Class, and I'm waiting, and I'm waiting, and the scene just literally never comes. That's weird, right? Like, that's odd. They set it up. Like, more than once, they reiterated the setup. I can only imagine something must have not worked and it got left on the cutting room floor, perhaps. But either way, without this scene, I'm not sure why King Shark is even here. Well, I mean, I know why he's here. It's to make a shit ton of merchandising money. But plot-wise, he doesn't really bring anything to the table. And story-wise, thematically speaking, there's nothing his character represents that isn't better represented by the other characters. Like, I would totally get it if he wasn't particularly plot-necessary, but he got a big thematic we are group moment for lack of something better to compare it to and he kind of gets a little bit of a conversation about friends in the first half of the film but it's just not enough to justify his presence for me. That said though, it's a minor complaint in the grand scheme of things. The film's still a blast with great character, a fun bouncy pace, and perhaps most surprisingly, and I mean surprising in a good way, it's actually home to some strong and blatant political commentary. I left that last point till now because I really do want to briefly talk about this stuff, but to do so would go into spoiler territory. And I'm aware at the time of my writing this movie isn't even out in most places, for once the UK was the place that got it early, fucking mint. So I thought I'd leave this point to last just to give anyone who hasn't seen the film and doesn't want spoilers the chance to get my recommendation and then go in with fresh eyes. But if you don't care about spoilers, then I'm about to jump into some stuff right now. So, uh, this film with the big talking shark and the man who shoots polka dots, it's about the human cost of the US's continued interference in global politics and their unethical practices both privately and on the world stage, right? Like, that's not just me, that's, that's like the blatant point of the film. It's not even subtext, it's right there in the text. The second half of the the movie sees us introduced to final villain Starro, a giant alien life form that the fascist government island nation of Corta Maltese have been building into a weapon of mass destruction, if you will. Under the guidance of Peter Capaldi's portrayal of a villainous scientist called The Thinker in what they're calling Project Starfish. Only, what? Surprise, surprise! 
It's actually the Americans that funded this really grim, violent, depraved and immoral project and now it's got out of hands under a new regime they don't control. The Suicide Squad are actually there, unbeknownst to them, to cover the whole thing up? What? The American government overstretching beyond its reasonable boundaries and doing shady, cruel, unethical shit without the public's knowledge? And then using further unethical tactics to cover the whole thing up with no regard for human life? Colour me shocked. What an incredible work of fiction. That almost definitely never happens in reality. I mean certainly not enough that you could make an entire top 10 list of pointless and cruel CIA projects posted onto YouTube and have me come on as a voice guest for it, link in the description. Sarcasm aside, the film is very very apparent in its political commentary and makes no attempt to skirt around it. They even give the thinker an entire monologue specifically about how cruel his work is and how deeply ingrained the American government was in that cruelty. You'd be hard pressed to argue the film isn't making some kind of point here. Also, I love the clashing dynamic between Peacemaker and Rick Flagg. Both represent the kind of textbook American soldier, but at different levels. Flagg gets a shocking rude awakening when he discovers America's role in this atrocity and wants to share the information because he feels the people deserve to know, whereas Peacemaker is not only undisturbed by it, but completely complicit in its cover-up, the only member of the squad to be told the real mission. What an apt but sad metaphor it is then that when these two ideologies clash, the one that wins out in the end is that of the shady, war crime complicit bastard man. And what's super interesting is just how much his casting lends to this statement. Like seriously, how great a casting is it that this role is played by John Cena, a man who bleeds Americana, a multiple time wrestling world champion, a man who holds the record for most wishes honoured at the Make-A-Wish Foundation, a dude who literally stars in patriotic ads for the Love Has No Labels campaign, a bloke whose entire career is defined as being a good guy, an aspirational guy, an all-American apple pie kind of guy. Cena is in many ways like the positive image of America in human form, and he here he is in this role getting his hands dirty and wiping away their shameful secrets. It's a brilliant subversion of the imagery we associate him with being used to further hammer an idea home. Hell, in less obvious commentary, the opening to this fight is depicted only in the reflection of Peacemaker's helm, which not only makes for a cool visual, but also adds a sense of irony to Peacemaker's comment about how his helmet isn't a toilet seat, it's a symbol of liberty. And you know, when by the end of the film the main visual you associate it with is the reflection of a America's violent cover-up of the awful consequences of its own actions? Well, I guess Gunn's making a pretty clear statement on what liberty means here. And if that wasn't enough to really just spell out exactly what's being said, the first time we hear the alien Starro speak, he says something like, why are you doing this to me? I was happy just floating in space. I mean, come on. This huge monstrous creature going on to cause massive amounts of destruction in a foreign land and a massive casualty account that America actually in the words of the squad's government employed leader considers a bonus, all literally only because America didn't leave something alone they had no right meddling with. There's a distinct sentiment being made here, and it's one that's a welcome addition to the film, giving it far more meat on its bones than it really even needed to have. This could have just been a cool fun superhero movie filled with memorable oddball characters that stuck solely to its themes of finding friendship, acceptance, and humanity and community in your fellow weirdos. And it would have been perfectly fine, and I'd still have had a great deal of positive things to say about it. But Gunn and his team went the extra mile to give this film that extra level of depth, wrapping it all in this timely social and political commentary. And I personally appreciate that and thought that it brought the film up to an even higher level than it was already at. This film was a great surprise and I enjoyed it far more than I expected to. There's actually still more stuff I could talk about, like how I almost wish it wasn't marketed at all as it opens with a really cool bait and switch that's unfortunately completely lost on you if you've seen even a single trailer. And I could also talk for ages about how comparing how it introduces its characters and uses their performances to how the original Suicide Squad introduces its characters would be a really cool writing lesson, with the original giving each person their own isolated montage and just expositing who they are at you, and how that differs to when we're given introductions to this one cast where it's in a way where they're introduced to each other one by one and given the option to bounce off one another in dynamic ways that tell us more about who they are as people than any action figure style bullet point list of a backstory could ever give us. But that could be a whole video in itself and I'm already where I'm going long on this one. So I'll just stop yammering and leave it at that and just end it by saying, obviously, 
I recommend it. Anyway, I've been Dan Drambles. If you enjoyed this video, then please let me know with a like and a comment and be sure to subscribe to my only dance at the red button below. And also, if you'd like to see yourself amongst these credits in future videos, as well as gain access to a bunch of other cool stuff and an exclusive Discord, then consider becoming a patron. There's a special offer on right now for the first 100 signups. Check it out, links in the description. This week, I'd like to give a special shout out to the following patrons. Mezlove, Steven, Scary Carry, and Dan, you don't have to read this one unless you think it's funny. Thanks for watching. Once again, be sure to subscribe and I'll see you next time.